Well, good morning, Calvary Bible Church. Uh, it is good to be with you here this morning. Uh, we want to introduce a, a, a special guest here with us, uh, Tom Coughlin. Uh, did I say that right? Almost? Cochran. Co- Cochran. Cochran. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Tom Coughlin is a football coach, not, <laughs> not Cochran. Uh, all right, sorry. So Tom Cochran is here with us uh, from Destiny Rescue. And so he's just going to come and, and share a little bit uh, about what's been going on with their ministry. Many of you are familiar uh, with Destiny Rescue as we've supported them throughout the years. Uh, Jessica Clater, who was just seen here this morning, uh, has been uh, leading uh, kind of this area a bit in, in just trying to raise awareness of their ministry. So uh, Tom, come share with us. Awesome. Thanks, Pastor Chris. It's good to, good to be with you, Calvary Church, and share with you a little bit about Destiny Rescue. So if you're unfamiliar with the ministry of Destiny Rescue, whether online or here in person, I, I want to share with you the fact that we exist to rescue kids out of sexual exploitation and human trafficking and help them stay free. Because we would all say in this room that kids should be free. Amen? Amen. Oh, come on. We would all say that kids should be free. Amen? The reality is, is that for some kids, that's not the case. See, Psalm 82.4 says to rescue the poor and helpless, to deliver them from the hands of evil people. It's a biblical mandate to rescue. And if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus rescued you and has now empowered us by his spirit to live out the greatest rescue mission of all time, sharing the gospel, encouraging people to follow Jesus, but also practically to rescue, as Psalm 82, 4 says, the poor and helpless, to rescue kids like Malika. See, as our team of agents goes out and finds kids in places where we know kids are being sold and rented, we found a young girl by the name of Malika and 14 other young girls from the age of 15 to 18. And as Malika came into our safe home, into our aftercare program, we were able to hear her story. And she was 18 years old, finishing the last year of high school when her parents came to her and said, you have to stop going to school and go into town to find a job so that our family could have money to buy groceries and survive. Malika goes into town to find a job and she's tricked and trapped working in an environment where she's forced to be with customers multiple times a night. And as she, as our agents found her and rescued her, brought her into our safe home, she began to share the dream that she has of being a nurse. And here's a picture of Malika now. As she's in our aftercare program, she's learning the skills necessary to become a nurse, finishing up education, and pursuing her dream. Because our goal is to rescue kids, but also help them walk along an individualized path to freedom so that they stay free, to pursue the dream that God has put inside of each one of them. And for Malika, that's to be a nurse. She's interning with some of our nurses on staff and learning the skills necessary so that at the end of her internship, the possibility of her being hired by our team to then go and reinvest and be able to bring care and, and, and health to those other girls who are being rescued in the country that she lives in. See, that's the reality of the gospel, isn't it? We're rescued to rescue. Can we say that? We're rescued to rescue. And and the reality is, is that Malika's story, while that is her story, there are still a million kids out in the world that are waiting for rescue. At least a million kids, tricked and trapped, waiting for the church to rise up, to be those on the greatest rescue mission of all time, and to help set them free, to rescue them from the hands of of evil people, as Psalm 82.4 says. And there's some great ways that you guys are already partnering with us. Many of you who know us, you're supporting us financially as rescue partners. You're praying for us. And can I tell you, thank you. Because it's going to take all of us to do this work. It's going to take all of us to join on this rescue mission. So thank you for your continued prayer and support. Out in the lobby, I have a table set up where we'd love to talk with you more about how you can help bring rescue to kids like Malika. Kids who are waiting and begging, asking God to say, God, would you send an angel to rescue me? Much like Tala when we found her, she had been begging God for three months that God would send an angel to rescue her. Our agent found her. Today, Tala is leading Sunday school and leading worship in her local church in the Philippines. There are kids waiting, and church, you're the answer. Thanks so much for your time, for being able to share an update, and also to be able to connect with you after service about how you can use your voice to bring rescue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Let's just uh, take a moment and pray for uh, the work that Destiny Rescue is doing and, and, uh, and how God is rescuing these children. Father, we come to you today and we ask that you would continue to 
uh, just provide in mighty ways for the work that Res- Destiny Rescue is doing. Lord, we pray for those children that uh, are, are being trafficked and enslaved. We pray that, um, that you would redeem and rescue them and pull them out of uh, death and darkness, that they would be able to experience uh, just fullness, uh, completeness, Lord, even just rest. Uh, we pray that you would do a mighty work in our hearts this morning, Lord, as we dive into your word that you would uh, continue to shape and mold us, that we would know your person and character, and that we would delight in you, and that we would find freedom in your word. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, it is good to be with you today. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Exodus chapter 20 as we continue taking a look at uh, the Ten Commandments. Uh, this morning... We'll be taking a look at uh, the command to remember the Sabbath day. Uh, I've been enjoying this series in particular, uh, and and Pastor Tally did a a good job early on just kind of setting the tone uh, for this series, really about making much of God in in all areas of our life, and that we find freedom in our obedience and in our our effort to, to shape our lives around God's character in person. And I, I like to think that the Ten Commandments are a reflection of the character of God and they, they proclaim his values. They, they enlighten us to what God cares about. Uh, the, we as uh, parents sometimes, you know, our kids know what we're concerned about usually by uh, the rules that we give them, right? And, and so uh, we care about you having a clean room. I don't want to walk into your room and, and have it smelling like a locker room. And so I care about cleanliness. So they're going to learn from those rules. And so we learn what God cares about through the commandments, through these, these, these freedom rules, as we've been calling them. And we're able to identify what he values and hopefully in tune, in turn, that we begin to value the same things. But ultimately, I found great comfort as we've been looking at the Ten Commandments because we're able to see God for who he is and what he cares about and find comfort that he cares about justice and he cares about morality and that he cares about us worshiping an almighty God who's worthy to be praised. And this Effort that we're going to, to uh, endeavor on this morning to, to understand uh, what it means to remember the Sabbath day is literally going to scratch the surface on this issue. The Bible is filled with uh, information at what does it mean to rest? What does it mean to have Sabbath? And in the Old Testament, uh, we find that the, the Israelites in this context, they have just been uh, rescued from Egypt. And so they're at Mount Sinai and, and, and Moses goes up and he, and he gets the Ten Commandments and he begins to uh, share with them these, these ways in which they're going to commune with God and they're going to have this covenant with God. And so much of the Old Testament in the Torah is, is, is instructions for how Israel was going to have connection and relation to God. And they had all of these rules and structures and feasts and and rituals that they were uh, participating in all so that they could experience the person of God and they could rest in his person and his character. And and our aim this morning is uh, to see and understand what is Sabbath rooted in. And there's going to be some changes for how we as New Testament believers experience and and practice Sabbath. But there's principles that we can uh, take a look at in how the Israelites interact with God. And we can glean uh, some some great wisdom for us. You see, the, the history of Sabbath rooted in the Old Testament uh, it is rooted in this word uh, Shabbat. And Shabbat is actually the word that is used in Genesis when God finished creating the earth and on the seventh day he rested. He Shabbat. He had Sabbath. Now, I get tired pretty quickly. I, I, I have, this week, I've been, like my neck has been like really bothering me. With the 6 a.m. on Monday, we had this meeting, and I sat up after the meeting and was feeling good. And I just stood up, and my neck went, and I was like, oh. And so my neck was like this for like most of Monday. 
And I am 35 years old. I shouldn't be having these problems, right? And my body was, I'm like, oh no. And John's like, oh, you're getting old. And I'm like, yeah, I guess so. This is, this is what it feels like to, to have your body give out on you. And so uh, it, it's impacted my sleep. And like, I, I can't, I, I'm a side sleeper. So I roll from side to side over throughout the night. And so anytime I shift my body weight, my neck, it's just like that shooting pain in my neck. And so I haven't rested very much. And so I, I'm exhausted and I, and I can feel this uh, just weight even now. Like, I, it's, like this side of the room, it takes, I have to like turn my head, body to see you. Um, but God, God's God. He doesn't get fatigued. He doesn't get tired. So he created the world and he did all this work. And it's not like he was tired. It's not like he was fatigued. This idea of rest that we see in Genesis was one that, that really represented fullness and completion. And so this is the spirit that he wants to give the Israelites as they're receiving this command to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. They began to practice this in many ways to pursue God's rest, to pursue his presence and to be in communion with him. And so they had... uh, Many ties to the number seven, and and we're just going to give you just a kind of a brief kind of uh, overview of some of the connections in the Old Testament here. And seven has this uh, connection to the idea that we see in the beginning of creation of completeness or fullness, right? On the seventh day, God rested. On the seventh day, everything was complete and there was fullness, right? And so every seventh day, they were to Shabbat. They were to have Sabbath. And so this meant that Friday afternoon, they were spent bustling and hurrying to make preparations before sunset. And so they would have to do their last minute shopping. They'd have to do food prep, getting the animals settled, children ready. And at sunset, everyone would gather around a table and they would light candles and they would say a prayer and it would go like this. They would say, blessed are you, God, ruler of the universe, who sanctified us with the commandment of lighting Shabbat candles. And then they would begin their day of Sabbath, their day of not working, but fixating and focusing their lives around the person of God. And this wouldn't end until sunset on the next Saturday. And so we can see how they discipline their lives around Sabbath. And we can see that Sabbath is a discipline of trust, surrender, and worship. Trust, surrender, and worship. And so Let's take a look this morning at uh, this commandment with this in mind. We're going to look at uh, two main passages that uh, tell this commandment to the Israelites, uh, both from from, uh, a little bit of a different perspective. First, we'll look at Exodus chapter 28 through 9, and then we'll read again in Deuteronomy chapter 5. So follow along with me in Exodus 20, and, and, and let's read verses 8 through 9. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, right? Keep the Sabbath day set apart. Holiness is is set apart. So Sabbath day is different than every other day of the week. It's different. It's set apart. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do or shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. In verse 11, I love this. They call back to creation to look back to what is Sabbath. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in it, uh, in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. He blessed the Sabbath day, and he made it set apart. I love how Matthew Henry says this in his commentary. He said, the eternal God did not rest as one weary, but as one well pleased. And Sabbath, for us, we can rest and look to our God and be pleased in his character. The circumstances of our life not may be pleasing. They're they're probably uh, difficult. For many of us, 
We, stopping and pausing work is not something we want to do because it's going to impact our productivity. Or it, it's going to infringe on what we want to get done. Or maybe it's going to infringe on our ability to play and go out and do recreation. To stop and center our lives around the person and character of God is an endeavor that should please us as a people to know God. I love that uh, this command is given to a people that they remember their history. They study the account of creation And they're all familiar with it as they receive this command. And for them, they are able to look back in Genesis and see that how God made a promise through Abraham to bless his people. And through Israel, they're his his chosen people and that he has a specific love covenant to them. They know this history. And so this command is given to them in a way that looks back to creation to remember God's work and to remember what it meant to rest. It, it signifies Sabbath rest and ties it to God's seventh day of creation in which he rested. This reminds me that God modeled Sabbath. Uh, an illustration of this, my, my daughter Charlotte is go, 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 go. She just, she is like energy to the max. And uh, she doesn't want to sleep. She has so much energy. She'll, you know, we'll put her to bed. We'll do stories. We'll read to her, pray, go to bed, Charlotte, good night. And then Laura and I will we'll go to sit down and then we'll hear a knock on the door. I'm not tired. What do I do? <laughs> You go lay down in your bed. She comes back five minutes later. I'm not tired. What do I do? Charlotte, you need to go down and lay down. And we've learned that if Charlotte doesn't get sleep, she is the most difficult early morning riser. So Madison, like, she'll lay down. She's her twin sister. She'll lay down and boom, she's out. Like, she'll, she's the kid who will be sitting around and she'll say, Dad, can I go to bed now? Like, is it, can I go to sleep? Is it time for bed yet? I'm ready. And I'm like, yeah, great, go for it. Brush your teeth, put your stories on. And she's, she'll be out cold. Charlotte, the other way around. But Madison, she rises early. She's making everybody's beds, even when they're still in them. Like, this kid is unbelievable. And so Charlotte, it's, it's like she's just this heap of human underneath all these blankets. And I'll get up and, and start doing my morning routine. I'll, all right, everybody, time to wake up. Get up. And Miles is yawning. Madison's already awake most mornings. Or she's sitting in her bed waiting for her to have permission to, to get ready for the morning. And Charlotte's, five more minutes. I just fell asleep, right? And, and so there's this, this battle that has gone on with trying to help her understand why she needs to sleep, why she needs rest. And so one of the things that we've actually done over, uh, a few times is I will climb up into her bed, and it's a top bunk, and it holds me. And, and so I'll, I'll snuggle her and, and just say, look, daddy's going to lay down and, and I'm going to fall asleep next to you. And so I have to, in a sense, model for her, it's time for bed. It, it's time for you to be able to settle your, your mind and settle your soul. And she has this little blanket. She's still at the age where she calls it her lovey. She's got a little tag and she like rubs it on her nose and it like soothes her. And so like she'll lay there and she'll rub the tag on my nose, you know. And so we're just trying to calm ourselves because if she doesn't get the rest, I know she's going to be a bear the next day. She, she'll have maybe act out in school, right? Because that, that sleep deprivation for a kid makes such a difference, right? Parents that are in the nap stage of life where your, your kids like get a mid-afternoon nap, oh, it's glorious. But when they don't get that nap, like your children becomes a little terror. And so God, in a sense, he's demonstrating to us, look, you need Sabbath, you, you need to stop and cease from work. And not simply because we need physical rest, we need to pause, but it, but it also it calibrates the soul. It centers the soul around seeing that in the presence of God, in the character of God, we can experience fullness and, and everything being well. We've been watching... Um, 
this series called The Chosen uh, that is um, a dramatic telling of the story of Jesus and his disciples. And uh, it's been really neat to, to enjoy. It's free. You can download their app and watch the, the whole show together. And, you know, they're, they're kind of giving you this beautiful just kind of unpacking of, of what it was like for, for Jews to be living in, uh, in Israel during occupied Rome. And, and, and their lives were just hard and difficult. And you see this one character, and, and they're, she's just battling being possessed by demons. And the, the holy men come, and, and, the, and they use Nicodemus to, you know, as the character that they're going to bring in to try to free her of the demon, and he has no power over it. And so you're like, man, this, this girl's just, just hopeless. And then there's this moment. She's walking in the streets, and, and Jesus shows up. And you, you don't really know that it's Jesus, but you know it's Jesus. And there's just this, this, this moment in this interaction where he calls her by her name and he says, you're my child. And, and you just feel like, oh my goodness, everything's going to be okay. Jesus is here. God's here. Like, he's, he's got this. All of the, 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 the anxiety, all of the, the, the hardship, all of the things that, that we're facing are because of a broken, sinful, and fallen world. But God created everything to be perfect and to be well, and he was able to pause and say, it's good, it's complete. And many of us, we have this longing in our soul, is my life complete? Am I experiencing that, that, that fullness of my life? Well, God provides that in his person. And so we practice Sabbath not because, um, only because we're tired, but also because we need to, to remind ourselves that in God, everything's okay. I like how Mark Buchanan says this. He says, uh, the Exodus command with its call to imitation, to, to rest like God rested after creation, plays on a hidden irony. We mimic God in order to remember we're not. Too often we try to pull ourselves out of whatever difficult situations we are. Or I'm tired, but I'm just going to press through. Or, you know what, I'm tired and everything's a mess, and so I'm just going to run from my mess. And, and then it's just kind of ever kind of you know, following me before. God sets Sabbath apart holy intentionally because we need that calibration. And he calls this in in verse 11 of chapter 20, he calls it blessed that this, uh, for for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Israel, look back to What God has done, who God is, that he is the author and creator of the world and you. He designed your soul. See, Sabbath is meant to center our lives around God, not ourselves. And see, these build on, these commandments, they, they, they are really greatly written. That God builds upon them. When you, you, you look back and you see what we've already covered as a church, and, and, and that you uh, shall not make for yourself any other, any other idols. There, there's nobody else. God is it, right? You shall not take the Lord's name in vain, right? He's, he's building upon this in each step, trying to tie back to, look, your lives should solely be centered around me. And in that, you will experience freedom and you will experience rest, fullness, completeness. This discipline of trust and surrender and worship is going to bring freedom into our spirit. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 5, and we see the the Ten Commandments listed again in this passage. And the context of where they are now is is that they've kind of begun to, to build upon the law and 
Egypt is in mind here, right? The Israelites had been captives in Egypt. They had been enslaved. And so they were made to work. Grueling, grueling masters that, you know, that just drove them to the, the, the brink of brokenness. And they, they weren't able to build a land for themselves, but they were building monuments for these rulers who were pursuit, uh, or in their pursuit of significance, trying to, to build these pyramids and build these structures to tell of their greatness. And the Israelites were made to work as slaves for someone else. They were captives in the land. And then God pulls them out of Egypt, rescues them. He crushes their, their masters in the Dead Sea, wipes them out, provides for them, brings them through the wilderness, right? Providing for them in, in meals, providing for them in direction on where to go and, and how to navigate the wilderness to find the promised land, right? And so all of these things, this context is in mind as we read uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, and we'll start in verse 12. It says, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord. All right, so that's the same as what we see in Exodus. But then he says here um, uh, on, in verse 14, but the, Sabbath, uh, the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no, uh, not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant, your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, so because of this, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So he goes back and in Exodus we see him point their attention to creation. And in Deuteronomy, when he's listing the command, he points their attention to, to Exodus, to being rescued out of Egypt. The Sabbath recalls rescue. It recalls not just God's creation and that we can trust and surrender to his created order, but we can also surrender trust and worship in his actions of rescue, that he keeps his promises to rescue and redeem his people. There's something to be said for my neck that I think is tied to stress. I'm doing grad school right now, navigating, just, just you know, juggling a lot of different responsibilities, and I'm sure stress is tied to my neck pain, right? And I just want it to go away, but, but sometimes as humans, we have stuff on our mind that we, we, we just... We go to bed at night and, and your mind's maybe racing or you're thinking about what's the next things I need to deal with or what's the next project or did I, did I water the lawn enough to avoid, you know, burnout with all this heat that's coming? Like all the things that kind of come into our, to our, our minds, right? And so we worry. We, we worry. We, we, we have all this stress that we carry. And I just I kind of want to let it go. I, just want, I, want, I want to be able to, 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 to be, I'm done with this. I don't want to carry this anymore. I just kind of want this, this to have a moment just to breathe, to feel like there's, there's kind of, there's, there's nothing <laughs> that I'm going to be able to do right now to accomplish what I want. I can just let go of it. Remembering God's work is so tied to that. It's that, it's that mental, spiritual, emotional freedom that says, yeah, guess what? The world is a mess. Yeah, there's so many things that you need to do and accomplish in your life. But you know what? Your position and your outcome for eternity is already secured. God's plans have already been communicated to us. And we can rest in them. And we can remember how he has worked which allows us to not be anxious about what's to come because whatever we face, we know God has worked this way before and he'll continue to work this way going forward. Sabbath recalls rescue. 
One of the things that I like about both of uh, the tellings of this commandment in Exodus and Deuteronomy is that there's instructions to the recipient of this command that they're to make sure that nobody in their household uh, doesn't keep the Sabbath holy. And and this is important for us uh, as leaders and leaders in our home or even leaders in the workplace. You ever had that boss who you feel like you you don't get a break? Like, you, you know, you're like, you're always living in, in worry that they're going to come and, and say, you're not doing good enough, and so that's it, like you're done. <laughs> or you're, you're worried about trying to make sure that uh, you keep your job, and so there, there's, there's no respite. There's always just, just worry that you're afraid that your, your position isn't secure. Folks, with God, we're secure. Your position is secure. And you can find rest in him. And so leaders, lead your homes in a way, lead your companies, lead your your workplace in a way that says we can rest, we can experience Sabbath in the Lord. And that's not just a trivial thing. That's not like a, you know, hey, you know what, let's whirlwind, get everybody ready, get to church so we can we can attend service and that's that's Sabbath. No, that's not, that's not Sabbath. <laughs> Sabbath is leading your home to say, look, we're going we're gonna to take time and designate this as family to pause, reflect on God's creative work, his creative order, to reflect on his rescue work, and to worship, and to center our lives around him. To trust, to surrender, and to worship. Do we lead our homes that way? Because this command includes that. Make sure that you are keeping that day holy. Make sure leaders, that home leaders, that you are empowering your family to trust, surrender, and worship, and not the opposite. I like how this all hinges and turns in the New Testament. And and again, for time, we don't have the the ability to take a a deep dive into this, but God interacts with his people in different dispensations. And so he interacts with uh, the Israelites in in, in his covenant, and uh, he he gives them rules and laws, and the New Testament calls the law a tutor, uh, preparing the way for Christ, right? That Christ is going to come and fulfill and complete everything, right? And so all of creation, all of humanity is longing for that eternal rest. The book of Hebrews uh, expounds upon this a lot. But each iteration of these uh, new tests, or of these commands to have Sabbath, they, they, remember significant moments in their history. So in Exodus, we saw that they remembered that significant moment of creation. In Deuteronomy, they remembered the significant moment of rescue and being brought out of Egypt. And in the New Testament, the most significant moment for the church, which is where we are living in this age now, the church age, the most significant moment for us in our faith history is the resurrection. Jesus rising from the dead, demonstrating the authority and and power over sin and death. And so that moment changed the way that we trust, surrender, and worship. It changed the way that we practice the discipline of Sabbath. We see that the disciples began to, to worship on different days even. The disciples gathered on the first day of the week rather than on, on Friday night into Saturday, like in Acts 27 or 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 2. And even in Revelation 1.10, uh, it specifically refer, refers to what we call now the Lord's Day. So instead of saying, hey, we're going to practice Sabbath, we gather on what we call the Lord's Day. And in our tradition, we worship on Sundays, and we call this the Lord's Day. And that's our day that we gather as a people in the discipline of trust, surrender, and worship. We trust in God's person and character. We surrender our attitudes and minds to the teaching of his word, and we worship him collectively And we begin to do that so then out of our attitude of surrender, trust, and worship, we live out the rest of our week. 
And we're able to enjoy that the, the judicial penalties of the Old Testament law and the ceremonial legalities of resting on Saturday, they've been eliminated because of the work of Jesus. Warren Wiersbe says it well this way. He says, the Sabbath symbolizes the old covenant law. You labored for six days and then you rested. The Lord's Day commemorates the new covenant of grace, right? It opens the week with rest in Christ and the works follow. And so out of our Sabbath, out of our rest in the person and character of God, we're able to work mightily unto the Lord. We're able to work with a joyful heart, even when it's hard, even when it's messy, because we know that our souls are secure. See, Sabbath worship bears witness to the person and character of God. We gather on Sabbath day on the Lord's day to remind one another and worship and commemorate Christ's resurrection. That's why we participate in things like communion. And that's a, that's a, a, a practice that we do every month because we do not want to forget it. But that changed, the work of Christ changed our entire means of access to God, of relationship to God. And so when we think about our rest, when we think about our Sabbath day, the Lord's day, I couldn't help but ask myself, what are humanity's threats to Sabbath worship? What are, what are the threats to, to cause us to not follow this command to keep the Sabbath holy? We're, we're given that command, keep it holy, keep it set apart. It's important that you practice the spirit of trust, surrender, and worship. How do we, what, what are the threats to that? I think they're in three tiers, significance, comfort, and control. You see, in Sabbath, we're surrendering all of those things to the Lord. And it's a pause from work to say, centering our lives around God is so important that we take a whole day to do it. And so we pause from our work. But many times our work is aimed at these three things, significance, power, and control. I'm working to gain my significance. The Israelites experienced that in Egypt. They were working to build someone else's significance, Every pyramid had to outdo the, the pyramid that was built before it. It needed to be bigger and wider and stick out more. Some of us, we are so fixated on building our significance that we don't pause, that we don't stop, that we don't have Sabbath where we surrender and that we trust the Lord that he's determined your significance. He created you. You're significant because he created you. Amajo Dei. You're made in the image of God. Your significance comes from him. And for us as New Testament believers, even more so, your significance comes from your faith in Jesus. Do we trust him that that's true? Or do our lives reflect a drive that says, I can't stop because I have to be Important. I have to have significance. I have to accomplish this. Can you trust that God's word is true? And can you surrender your significance to the Lord? The other side of that is comfort. Some of us, we don't care if we're significant. What we care about is our comfort. I want to make sure that I'm not experiencing hardship or suffering. Or I want nice things. And I'm going to work to pursue to have things that make my life comfortable. And so we're not looking to God for our provision. We're not trusting him to provide. We're not content. We're not willing to surrender our comfort to the Lord and say, I can Sabbath rest and stop and say, I can stop working, Lord, to worship and then work heartily unto you to serve you. Rather than, I'm just going to continue to work, to work, to work, to work, and then our comfort overtakes our Sundays. So attending church is our, our little piece of, of Sabbath, of calibrate our soul, but we got to get out of here as quickly as I can so I can go play. 
so I can get to whatever is going to bring me comfort. You know, I work for the weekends, right? So then I can, I can play. Now, I'm not saying that hobbies are intrinsically wrong. What I'm saying is that they can become idols. And we were already told, don't have any other idols. And some of us, we don't like to have Sabbath. We don't like to stop work or rest, trust, surrender, and worship because we need control. And most of that is derived from our own fear. Many times we've experienced hurt in our lives. And so we say to ourselves, I never want to experience that again. So I'm going to do everything in my power to control everything so that doesn't happen again. And we work to control our lives. And in controlling our lives, we're saying, I'm going to pave my own way to make sure I get what I think I need and I want. And what that says is that I'm not trusting, I'm not surrendering, I'm not pausing to say, Lord, I'm giving my life to you, I'm going to follow you, and that probably is going to include getting hurt and suffering. It may include betrayal, like Jesus experienced. It may experience people who you share life with for years, and then they pretend like they don't know you, kind of like Peter did to Jesus. That, that's the path that Jesus tells us as believers, look, if you follow me, you're going to experience that. And so we don't have Sabbath. We don't experience that. We don't follow that attitude of trust, surrender, and worship because we're so fixated on controlling our lives. And I love, I absolutely love what Jesus says in Matthew 11 as we wind down here. Matthew 11 Verses 28 through 30. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light, he says. Verse 29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. See, this is... The most important thing for God is our souls. He's worked hard to rescue and redeem our souls because he created us. And he is still working to provide what our souls long for and need. And that is rest in him. Resting in Christ allows us to find our significance in his work. Our comfort in his presence and provision in surrendering control, knowing he will never leave us, forsake us, or fail to come through on his promise. This is the discipline of Sabbath. This is the attitude that we can work to have as a people to live in freedom, knowing that we have a God who has modeled for us what does it mean to stop and to experience the completeness and the fullness of God. Calvary, together, let's be a people that trust God, that surrender getting our way, surrender our lives, and let's worship because we have a God who cares for our souls, who cares for us in such a way that he would lovingly tell us that we need to center our lives around him knowing that that's the best thing for us. That's the best peace, fullness, and rest you will ever experience. It's your closeness to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you reveal to us your character, that you communicate your concern for your people. Lord Jesus, you said that Man was not made for Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for man. The discipline of resting and calibrating our souls, that you did that for us. Lord, I pray that we would obey you in that. Lord, there's people here this morning, they're struggling to trust you. They're doubting. Lord, is, is what you say true? Is your word really, really mean that? Or they're struggling to surrender, Lord. They're, they're dealing with hurt. They're dealing with doubt. They're dealing with maybe even control issues, Lord. 
Today, you call on us to surrender those things. So I pray, Lord, that we as a people would continue to worship on the Lord's day, that we would be a people to discipline ourselves, to come each week, calibrate our souls, and that we would worship you throughout the week. We pray these things in your name. Amen.